Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where I amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 170 of the podcast today. So today we get to listen to another of Collider's Collision series. Again, we just thought these were very pertinent conversations happening right now um, about how the community is responding to COVID-19 and what resources are available for our local business and innovation community. So on the podcast today, we get to talk with Jerome Furson and Emily Johnston of the United Way of Olmstead County. The United Way of Olmstead County was started locally as a community chest in 1925, so they're celebrating their 95th anniversary here this year. And the community chest was a way to give back to Rochester and the surrounding community. The organization came to be known as the United Way of Olmstead County in 1972. So on the podcast today, Jerome and Emily talked about the brand new fund that the United Way and numerous partners in the community are raising called the Together COVID-19 Community Support Fund, which is a fund to support Rochester area nonprofits around the financial stresses due to COVID-19. They expect this grant application to be streamlined and the funding distribution committee to uh, meet every two weeks for the first few months to uh, look at applications for the fund. The United Way and their partners aim to raise this to a million dollar fund and to date, as of April 7th, they had already raised $685,000. So a huge task to benefit our local area nonprofits. So before we launch into today's podcast, just a reminder that you can find the Rochester Rising podcast Really, wherever you listen into your podcast content, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're also on Spotify and on YouTube as well. We have our own YouTube channel, so you can check us out there. So in addition to doing the podcast, we put out weekly articles and some video content talking about the entrepreneurial climate and culture here in Rochester, Minnesota. So you can find those on our website at rochesterrising.org, and you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right, so now on to the podcast with Jerome and Emily of the United Way of Olmsted County. Welcome, everybody, to the Collider Online Collision Series. My name is Jamie Sunsbach. I'm the Director of Operations here at the Collider Foundation. And with me today is Jerome Pearson, President and CEO of the United Way of Olmsted County, as well as Emily Johnson, the Vice President of Community Impact for the United Way of Olmsted County. So thank you so much for joining us. It's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, So I know uh, people are familiar with the United Way, but really uh, I've been doing my homework and looking at back at the history and and a tremendously rich history of what the United Way has done in the Rochester area for so many years. I was just wondering if you could touch on a little bit about the history of the United Way in Olmstead County and and the tremendous impact that you've had in, in the community. Uh, sure. Thanks, Jamie. So <clears throat> if you've done any research on the United Way of Olmstead County, you probably come across our history page on our website, which is uwolmstead.org. And uh, out there we have a uh, bit of a description, but it, we're approaching our 95th anniversary uh, here in Olmstead County. Uh, we started back in 1925 as a community chest, as an uh, efficient way of giving to the community and all the uh, various organizations that were present at the time. And then over the course of a number of years, I think uh, starting in 1972, we became the United Way of Olmstead County and um, <clears throat> that began the uh, traditions of United Way in Olmstead County, uh, which basically stayed uh, intact. So the community chest was fundraising primarily. United Way, when it started in 1972, uh, carried forward those traditions of fundraising. And then in about 2004, we matured and evolved uh, to address and really to evolve with our growing community. So Rochester, uh, Currently has changed since 1925 till now, and uh, for any organizations uh, that are longstanding, the uh, you know the, the challenge and the forces to adapt and, and evolve with the community are present. And so I'm pleased to that United Way of County was uh, making progress during those periods since starting in 2004 became a community impact United Way, and then most recently uh, since uh, 2014 or so, which is when I joined the United Way here uh, in Olmsted County my hometown, which I'm just so delighted to be back in Rochester. Uh, it's a great privilege to serve with the United Way here. Um, 
we started to uh, evolve a bit further. So we would can still consider ourselves to be a community impact United Way, which as any organization requires re resources to pursue a mission that can be a for-profit business or a non-profit business, but uh, everything requires resources to, uh, to pursue missions. So we still have fundraising at our, at our core, but we apply that to uh, achieve specific community changes and uh, to help our community change and to improve in very specific ways. So rather than just being uh, what would be considered historically a pass through or a fundraising and then we pass the money through to other organizations, uh, we're adding value to the uh, to the chain of events uh, every step of the way now. And uh, Emily is deeply in the throes of that work. Uh, she's that's her primary responsibility. And as is Grace uh, Pesh, who you mentioned earlier, she's uh, our front person on a number of programs. So she does wonderful work in that regard. But United Way of Olmstead County today is vastly different than what it was in 1925 and even vastly different than it was in 1972 and quite a bit different than it was in 2004. Uh, as our community has changed and evolved over that same period of time, we've tried to stay on top of the curve and uh, stay ahead of the curve, so to speak. So not to flatten the curve, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a bit too soon for that. <laughs> no. Um, Emily, is there anything you'd like to add? I don't think there's anything to add to that. Okay. Pretty good. Well, great. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate having that history section of your website. You know, so, so many organizations really don't tell their story, especially one that has this storied history. So um, it was really eye-opening for me to really learn more about the history. So I, I really we're, appreciate uh, that. We're working on some revisions, not to the history portions, but to the current events. Uh, we hope to have posted out there soon. Cool. So um, obviously we're, we're meeting in, in sort of a unique time in the history, not only of our city, but the world. Um, and uh, I found out uh, yesterday that uh, the United Way is really taking some uh, leadership role on helping to support our community through uh, your COVID-19 community support funds. So um, first of all, could you talk about really the local financial climate, uh, specifically uh, the struggles businesses and nonprofits are facing and why you decided to take a leadership role to raise these funds? Sure. And I should clarify the TOGETHER fund that we started is in conjunction with a number of community partners. So United Way is one of many uh, community partners that have launched this fund. And I'll maybe speak more specifically to those in a minute. But in terms of the financial climate, I think, um, you know, it's it's a challenging time for uh, most entities, whether it's government, nonprofits, for profits, uh, you name it. It's really a challenging time that's born out of a lot of uncertainty and, of course, a lot of changes in behavior. Um, so from a nonprofit's point of view, which we are most familiar with, uh, we have some nonprofits that were providing vital services to uh, individuals and families in need that have had their name, their needs upended by other more pressing needs related to health care or employment. And that shifts the nature of the needs and where they're uh, uh, going to find their support and services from some agencies to other agencies. So there's a shifting of demand, if you want to think of it in economic terms. Uh, some uh, nonprofits are really inundated and seeing uh, pressures related to not being able to satisfy the increased need. Others are seeing the, the needs that they were addressing take kind of a back seat or a second seat to the more pressing needs. And so they're seeing a decrease in demand, which uh, lends itself to uh, challenges in revenue. So there's really, a, it's a mixed bag when it comes to what the tensions are that are being faced by nonprofits in our community. And it's not dissimilar, I don't think, in the for-profit world. We just have less firsthand kind of experience working in that environment. So uh, it's all supply and demand and where demand is right now is it's not the same place it was two weeks ago. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, just kind of uh, back or going back to, you know, trying to understand a little more about uh, uh, what were the, what were the needs that you were hearing that were sort of, you know, spurring this discussion about how to create this fund and, and uh, and just if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Sure. So the community partners launched uh, together COVID-19 response fund to support the greater Rochester area nonprofits. And this was born out of some recognition and from what we're hearing on a variety of different, uh, whether were phone calls, video conference calls, or in-person conversations, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations more than in-person probably, <laughs> video calls, you know, you know the drill. Um, about the, the financial positions that most nonprofits were in prior to the crisis. So 
nonprofits, um, partly due to the name, uh, you know, try to uh, put all of their money to towards mission and do it on a kind of a, a year to year basis. So there's not a, a lot of reserves built up over time to weather significant disruptions in either in uh, current cash flow or increases in demand, which stretch uh, resources in the present. And so uh, basically the, the fund that we launched in conjunction with Rushed Area Foundation, Mayo Clinic, and others um, really is, is designed to support nonprofits that are seeing that are under duress related to the COVID crisis response. And we have particular, uh, uh, we're paying particular attention to those nonprofits that are serving individuals and families uh, on, that are seeing increased need. So uh, supports that they're providing supports to the community, uh, which I think is an important point. Um, so it's not, well, we're focusing on nonprofits overall and trying to address all the needs in the nonprofits. We, st we still, at the end of the day, realize we have limited funds. We're closing in on $600,000 raised. We're shooting for a million. That really does pale in the comparison of the overall needs in the community. So we need to be somewhat strategic in how we deploy and make sure that we're addressing the, the you know, first order problems first and then move on to the, the next ones as we, as we either find time and resources to do so. We're also thankful and, and appreciative of what's developing on the state front uh, in terms of support and what's happening, of course, at the federal level with some of the different uh, relief packages that the Congress has passed. So in concert, we think there is a, a variety of movements that will enable critical nonprofit support to continue in our community uh, for the foreseeable future, which is important to our community's response. Yeah, and it's been a it's been a confusing time for you know for profits and nonprofits. Just uh, it seems like uh, every day there's there's something else that pops up, whether it's at the state level, the federal level, or the local level. Um, so, you know, I, I just I, I thank you for for doing this, and it, it is it is very confusing. And you know, we're we're taking calls from people uh, every day saying, "Well, now this is true. This wasn't true yesterday," and yeah, it, no, it's been a very confusing time. Yeah, I, you would be, uh, we could probably all have a full-time sense maker on our staffs and we still wouldn't make sense of it all. <laughs> uh, it is so, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of, um, are there any limits on this fund for people who apply for nonprofits, um, how the money can be used? Um, you know, because I, I know coming from a nonprofit background, when we're trying to raise money, you know, there's every grant is different. Every time we ask for money, it's a little, little bit different rules. So just to kind of help some of our nonprofits in our community, maybe understand a little more about what this money can be used for uh, would be, I think, helpful to them. Sure. So uh, we are still in the process of raising money for the fund. Um, and the idea that uh, this fund uh, we have initially, we've raised over $550,000 from Key community partners. This would be Mayo Clinic, Rush Area Foundation, United Way, uh, Think Bank, IBM, PepsiCo, uh, Sand and Gravel, Lasker Jewelers. I'm probably missing one in there without a list in front of me. Um, and uh, the way that we designed it was for individual organizations that are contributing $25,000 or more, they'll help to make up a distribution committee that will evaluate applications as they come in from area nonprofits. Uh, we're, uh, the, some of this is still being fleshed out, Jamie, in terms of the actual uh, parameters because we, we had to get the funds established and get some money flowing. And now we're into the real throes of designing the, uh, the nitty gritty details. So bear with me on some of these are still sketchy, but the, the idea at the, uh, at the outset is that we make this really uh, light and uh, to reduce the burden on applying for uh, support from the fund. So the grant application is going to be really uh, streamlined in terms of the questions it's asking and the information that it needs to for the distribution committee to to assess the um, the various applications. So that's the, the kind of the first step. Uh, once the applications are received, the fund distribution committee is going to be meeting on a fairly regular basis. I think we've established now, Emily, is it once every other week? Yeah, I think the plan um, from April through June um, is to meet and review applications every two weeks, um, and then probably starting in July monthly after that, so that we can continue to monitor how the situation changes and review applications um, as long as there's money and as long as there's need through the rest of 2020. Yeah. 
And Jamie, one of the first uh, orders of business for the, uh, the the partners to discuss and to resolve is, is there a maximum amount that can be received through the fund? Uh, we do think there will be a maximum amount set. We're just not quite sure at what level yet. So um, there'll be some more communications following on the next couple of days to nonprofits in the area that would uh, provide some direction in that regard. Sounds good. I know this is a this is a very quick process. I've been really impressed with uh, the speed at which you've you've been able to <laughs> to raise the money and and without going into too many details, um, you know how what's this like to 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 raise this much money to really move this forward? Uh, you know what how how much time are you on the phone? How much time are you you know just to kind of give us a peek of of, of how much effort this takes because I'm sure it's a it's a monumental task. Um, well, it's it, it's monumental and it's also fairly inspiring. Um, so when you're working in a community where there is a deep philanthropic spirit, where organizations realize that they have a role to play in the ongoing health of our community even through the crisis, uh, it makes making phone calls and the response it makes it less of a burden, so to speak. So it's not as monumental. Uh, and that, that environment, I just can't un underscore that enough. I mean, it's really, uh, really inspiring when you uh, work in a community as close knit and as um, supportive as that, in, as that we have here in Rochester. Um, that said, we also are blessed with a very uh, talented team. And so the number of calls and the, the, the asks being made of organizations were spread across a number of individuals. So it reduced the task on any one. Uh, which is also helpful during a period of time like this. So that was a, a blessing. Um, so, you know, we started uh, in earnest uh, well, probably about what, 10 days ago, uh, coming together with the Rochester Area Foundation and Mail Clinic and United Way to discuss the idea of having a united or unified community response fund versus each one of us trying to do our own thing and and uh, doing okay with it, but probably not as more as powerful as we could do it together. So we hammered out an agreement probably 10, 10 days ago to approach the response fund in a unified fashion and then went quick to work contacting uh, key organizations. And, um, you know, again, uh, here we are on March 30th, I guess, yesterday, uh, we announced or uh, released the, uh, the fund to the public at large and we're continuing to secure donations to the fund. Uh, the thermometer's ticking up every day. Uh, and we encourage your listeners to uh, find us. You can find us at uwomstead.org and you can find a link there to give or the Rochester Area Foundation also has information on their website related to the fund. And so either way, either organization, it's highly appropriate. I mean, there's no wrong way to donate. Um, but, you know, the, the process really, I mean, it, when, when you got your site set on helping individuals and families in need uh, if, and you, you're meeting a welcoming community in terms of philanthropic spirit, uh, it really is not a burden. It's not as monumental as what it looks like from the outside in. If that makes sense, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I but I still hats off to you and your team. I think that's is, this has been a, a huge thing for our community, and and really thank you for this. I really do appreciate it. Um, so I know the United Way. You know, there's so much more than than of course than just this. Uh, our Collider participated in. Um, I'm trying to remember what the the Running Start program, I believe, is what it's called. Uh, we did that last year, and that was a fantastic thing. Um, you know, what are, what are some other things the United Way does in our community? And just to give people an idea of, of potentially uh, beyond this, uh, how they can help. How much time we have? About five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, this is your wheelhouse. Take it away. So there are a couple of things that I'd highlight for listeners um, right now who are wondering about what United Way is doing to help community members who are facing this crisis, um, things that are available all the time, um, but are particularly pertinent now. Um, one is our um, statewide 211 information and referral um, system. And this is um, an interconnected system of local um, information and referral services that's the most comprehensive and up-to-date database of local health and human services resources here in Olmstead County. And back in the day, your younger listeners may not know, but you used to dial 411 for directory assistance and 211 is like uh, information and referral for health and human services the way 411 was directory assistance. So you dial 211 um, or um, from some of our cell phone carriers, there's an 800 number, which is, look at it right now, one 800 
543-7709. And uh, there's also text and um, online chat available. And uh, folks can talk to a trained professional um, about what their needs are that they're facing. um, And that person can help them connect to local resources to help meet those needs, whether that's mental health care or rent assistance um, or uh, getting meals on wheels sent uh, to uh, a grandparent or something like that. Um, We are working really hard um, locally uh, to make sure that in this changing landscape that we're getting all that information up to date um, as quickly as possible. So two and one um, is one thing I'd I definitely would want your listeners to know about. Um, United Way also provides a volunteer matching portal uh, to the community. It's called Get Connected, which people can access at volunteer.uwolmstead.org. Um, and we have that um, updated for the current crisis um, with volunteer opportunities um, that are still available. Um, so folks can create an account, see what types of volunteer opportunities are available. We've also plugged in um, some needs from organizations that are looking for in-kind donations. We're hearing a lot um, uh, at United Way of people saying, you know, I want to donate some toiletries or toilet paper. Um, So we have those opportunities in there, as well as some virtual volunteer opportunities for people who may not be able to get out in the community physically right now because they're social distancing, but you want to do something to contribute. Um, So that's our Get Connected tool. Um, The last thing I'd say is um, our family-wise prescription discount um, program, um, which folks can find on our website, which is um, basically a reusable coupon um, for prescriptions. You know, that families right now that are um, facing financial pressures due to this uh, crisis um, should know that it's available at most of the major pharmacies here in Olmsted County and locally people average about a 43% discount um, and that's available to people whether they're um, insured or uninsured. And those are a couple things that we do. I think the other thing I'd say is that, you know, we, outside of our COVID-19 fund, we're still um, a local funder of nonprofits and continue to fund um, nonprofits that are doing fantastic work in our community in areas like housing stability and food security that we see under so much pressure right now, um, as well as programs that help make um, positive social connections that we know help support people in achieving their educational and health and financial goals. Um, organizations that support seniors and people with disabilities and living independently. So we continue to make those investments um, and provide support to our partner organizations in the community. Is that at all, Drew? Yeah, I just, I just, <laughs> what did I miss? I just, There's more, like, but that's... Man, you hit the high cool. points. You hit the high points, Emily. Nice job. Yeah. Fantastic. I can go on for a lot longer, but I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is quite a bit more to the work that we're doing at United Way Olmsted County about what's most pertinent and relevant to the time that we stand here today uh, with COVID-19 and our response. Those were the high points. So I think, um, yeah. So what other questions do you have, Jamie? That's essentially it. So um, I try to be respectful of your time. So uh, Jerome and Emily, you know, thank you for taking the time to connect with us. Um, it will, we'll give you a chance one more time. Uh, what's What's the what's the best way for anyone to connect with you and learn more about the United Way? Uh, great question, Jamie. Uh, the best place to, to anyone that's interested in learning more about the United Way to go is to go to uwolmstead.org. Uh, and there's information out there that can you know, satisfy any curiosity. Uh, if you, uh, there's our COVID response page, which you'll see as soon as you land on that, uh, that web address. Uh, if you want to learn how to get involved from a volunteer's uh, point of view, there's a uh, get involved tab. Uh, if you want to donate, there's a donate tab. So there's uh, there's pretty clear directions uh, out there on the website. That's the best place. And any of your listeners are always welcome to reach out. Uh, contact me via email is probably the easiest nowadays. So cell phone is blowing up all the time, so that's a little bit hard to do. But email Jerome F at uwolmstead.org is my contact email. Uh, more than happy to answer questions that way too. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for having us, Jamie. A big thanks to Jerome and Emily for joining us on the podcast today and on the Collider Collision series, talking about the the United Way of Olmstead County and their Together COVID-19 Community Support Fund. You can find out more about them at uwolmstead.org, and we have links uh, to their website and other social media accounts through the links in our bios. You can check them out there. 
We're always looking for stories of entrepreneurship from Rochester-based entrepreneurs to share on our podcast. So if you know of an entrepreneur with a story that should be shared, let us know and send us an email at rochesterrising at gmail.com. That's a wrap for the podcast today. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen into your content so that you never miss a story of entrepreneurship and innovation coming out of Rochester, Minnesota. We'll see you here next week with a brand new episode.